Hey everybody, Justin Miller, Oxnard College Physics here. Welcome to the show. So, beginning off the physics course, there's a lot of little things that we gotta do before we really get doing any physics. So a lot of this review type of stuff and just some general information, but we're still gotta go through it, talk about it a little bit, and move forward from there. So let's just get started. So, the question is, to begin with, what is physics, right? Physics, a lot of people think, oh, it's just a bunch of math. You're just uh, doing some math and trying to figure out some math problems and stuff. Physics is not math. It utilizes math. Math is a major tool utilized in physics, but physics is about understanding. It is about understanding the nature of the reality in which we're immersed. And with that understanding brings us the ability to, well, produce technologies, to better equip ourselves for survival, all sorts of good things come out of physics. So, ultimately, the idea is physics is about understanding. It is about building mathematical models at times in order to better understand scenarios, to logically analyze them, to figure out if this happens, what's going to happen next? Because if you know what's going to happen next, you can plan for it, right? Hey, if I know that if I kick this table, this table's going to go that way, Maybe I want it to run into something. I could put something in front of it. I could plan for it. It'd be a bad example, but nonetheless an example. So being able to understand the consequence of setting something into motion in a particular manner gives us the ability to plan for an outcome. And with that, enables us to have it do our bidding, to plan for it. So, this particular course, being mechanics, we're gonna basically be looking at motions of objects and different ways of analyzing systems, logically approaching them, breaking them down, making sense of them. That's what we wanna do in this course, make sense of things. Don't make this course about math. Math, yeah, there's gonna be a lot of math, but this isn't a math course. If you're good at math, that is great. It is helpful to be good at math, but it doesn't mean that you're automatically good at physics. Physics has an underlying, deeper aspect than just doing math. Not to say math isn't deep, but I mean just doing math. Math is very deep. But nonetheless, don't make this a math course. Don't solve problems just to solve them. Make sense of things. Try to make the connections. We're talking about physical things and responses in this work. So, Try to do the best you can to conceptualize, to visualize, to make sense of things. It will enable you to proceed onward in a enlightened manner, we'll say. So, at that, that's my little spiel, if you will, regarding what is physics and what you need to do. I'll reiterate some things as time goes on. But right now, we just want to kind of get to things and discuss some fundamental aspects that we need to I'm going to keep track of. So, in physics, we need to be able to make some measurements. We need to measure things. So the question becomes, well, what do we need to measure? And how do we measure it, right? Well, there's three fundamental things that we need to be able to account for. There's actually four, but in this course, there's only going to be three. And we're going to talk about what those are. What fundamental things can you think of that are highly important and that we measure on some daily basis? That's two of them. And I look over at the clock and I see the second hand tick, tick, tick. Oh my gosh, five seconds just went by. Time, right? Time's extremely important to us. We need to be able to account for it. How long does it take to watch this video? How long does it take to get from your house to the store or to your friend's house? How long do you have to live? It all comes down to time, right? Time's really important. How long do you have to do the things that you need to do in a given day? Time. So we need to measure time. Time is really important. Time. What do we measure time in? Well, there's all sorts of unitizations for time. You can measure it in days, in centuries, millennia, hours, minutes, years, 
seconds, all sorts of ways of measuring time. We're going to stick with what is known as SI units. Which are seconds. So SI, the International Scientific Units, Scientific Internationalist Units, that are agreed upon by scientists across the globe in order to be on the same page with what numeric values you're discussing pertain to certain measurements. So we're going to be using seconds a lot. We'll get to conversion factors later on. The time, SI units, seconds. What else is important to be able to measure? Fundamental, fundamental, stands alone. How about distance, length, things of that nature, right? How far away am I standing from this camera? You can't see the camera, but I can. How tall are you? How many miles is it from your house to the Empire State Building? Yeah, distance. Distance is pretty important. It enables us to gauge well, how far away something is. And we need to be able to measure distance. So we'll put up ourselves some distance slash length. SI units are meters. A little lowercase s, lowercase m to signify the units. But we're going to use meters a whole bunch for distances and lengths because that is the SI unit. In the United States here, we're pretty used to utilizing feet and inches and miles. That's great. We'll have to do some conversions from time to time. We'll get a good understanding of what meters are comparatively, but we're going to stick with meters a whole bunch. So you'll get used to meters if you haven't used it that much. It's a little bit over three feet, a little bit over 3.281 feet. But we'll get again to unit conversions. Another important thing to be able to measure. What else could there possibly be? Hmm. This one's not so discussed on a daily basis. Time and distance generally are to some degree. The last one is mass. Mass is the inherent culmination of all the particles of which you are composed put together. It is how much of something there is. Mass is different than weight. Weight is an interaction of mass with some sort of gravitational field. Mass itself is independent of weight. On Earth, my mass, all the protons, electrons, and neutrons that I'm composed of comprise, well, total mass. I stand on a scale and it tells me how much I weigh in pounds. But I go to the moon and I weigh different but it's still the same amount of mass, assuming that I haven't lost any particles or gained any particles. So mass is more about the inherent how much of something there is. And we'll get into further distinctions between mass and weight as time goes on. But again, mass is an important thing that characterizes an object or a substance. How much of it is there? We know that now mass is endowed by the Higgs boson, such things. I'm not going to really worry about that too much other than, hey, particles have mass. You put a bunch of particles together, you've got a bunch of mass. There we go. So mass. SI unit of mass is kilograms. KEG is the only prefixed SI unit, kilo meaning a thousand, thousand grams, but we use kilograms to um, denote measurements of mass. And you may say, well, wait, I weigh things in kilograms in a chemistry class. Actually, you're determining the mass. Weight gets sort of interchangeably used sometimes with determining mass and the weight of something. It's just built into the lingo, and at this point, it's just never been worked out. It's too ingrained in the human language, or at least the English language. So 
Don't confuse mass with weight. Kilograms is a measurement of mass. Weight is something else. Weight is something else. And we'll get to what that something else is. But there's the three major things that we need to be able to measure and keep track of. So everything else comes into be some compound composition of these different units. For instance, speed. How fast is something going? Well, that depends on how far it travels per unit time, right? That would be like meters per second. And we're going to get all sorts of compound units, and sometimes we'll call them completely something else, but they're all going to be built out of these three fundamental things that we need to be able to measure. All right, so that's a good start, making some measurements. Fantastic. What about some other things that we need to be able to keep track of, like making some unit conversions? Well, if you're going to find in homework and just in your daily life, you need to be able to understand what a meter is compared to a foot, what a second is compared to an hour, things of that nature. Mass, we won't really worry about unit conversions with that. We'll discuss that a little bit later on. But nonetheless, we're going to need to go from some U.S. customary units that we're used to utilizing and convert them into SI units, primarily for distances. So, unit conversions. Well, if you can look in any physics book or Google it, whatever you want, and it'll find some nice list of unit conversions that's out there, and you're going to see that they give it to you in terms of, hey, one meter is equal to 3.281 feet. So there's a unit conversion right there. One meter is equal to 3.281 feet. That's great. Because that unit conversion now allows me to understand how many feet any number of meters are. What if I say, well, we've got 10 meters. How many feet are in 10 meters? I just need this side to say 10. And this is, again, an equation here, an equality. What I do to one side, I could do to the other. So I could ask 10 meters is equal to question mark feet. How many feet? Well, I could take this and go 10 times 1 meter is equal to 10 times 3.281 feet. Thus, this will be 10 meters which is going to be equal to 32.81 feet. There we go. It's easy as that. You say 5 meters, I multiply both sides by 5. You say 72 meters, I multiply both sides by 72. It doesn't matter. I've got a nice standard formulization to go from meters to feet. But what happens if I say, well, you know what? I actually want to go from feet to meters. I want to say, how many meters are there in 10 feet? 10 feet is equal to how many meters? Well, what are we going to do with this? We need to understand that this unit conversion here can be inverted. And the inversion allows us to go from feet into meters. How do we produce the inversion? We want this side to say one foot. One foot is equal to so many meters, right? So what do we do? Divide both sides by 3.281. So we will have this, 3.281 feet divided by 3.281 is equal to 1 meter divided by 3.281. What I've done to one side, I do to the other side. Everything is golden mathematically. This becomes 1 foot. And this becomes, well, 1 divided by 3.281 is 0.3048. almost a third of a meter, one foot, a little bit less. But there's the unit conversion between feet to meters. Now, if I want to know how many meters there are in 10 feet, I go 10 times one foot is equal to 10 times 0.3048 meters, giving us 10 feet on this side is equal to 3.048 Meters. So there we go. 10 meters, 32.81 feet, 10 feet, 3.048 meters. And we got the nice unit conversions 
that go both ways. Generally, when you look up a unit conversion, it will only give it to you one way. Because if you have it one way, you invert it to get it the other way. Simple as that. <clears throat> so there is some nice uh, little things with unit conversions. This will be something that this and this, something that you utilize quite a bit in homework. Um, just because of homework problems, I t test you on your unit conversions. That's fine. fine. All right. What else do we have? We've also got ourselves some conversions between, say, well, seconds to minutes to hours. I think everybody should be on the right page with that. What do we have? We've got one hour is equal to 60 minutes. And we've got 60, excuse me, one minute. I should say min. One minute is equal to 60 seconds. You know, there's 24 hours in a day, we can keep going on with that, and on and on and on, 265 in a year, blah, blah, blah. Anyways, these two conversions are gonna allow us to do all sorts of things, because sometimes we'll be given things in minutes and hours, and we wanna know seconds. So what do we do? Well, the question becomes, one hour is equal to how many seconds, right? Well, we've got one hour, there's 60 minutes, and each minute has 60 seconds. So, what do we got? We should have 3,600, right? 60 minutes times 60 seconds, 60 seconds per minute. We've got one hour, it is 3,600 seconds. And we could again go on and on with that. This is pretty common, so I'm not gonna beat this up any more than that because you've done it before hopefully, and that's that. Mass, like I said, we're not gonna be doing any unit conversions with mass other than powers of 10, like grams to kilograms and such things. We'll get to that here in a little bit. But I will state that there is a US customary unit of mass that you almost never, ever, ever see or hear of unless you look at it in a physics book or look it up or are doing something odd, and it is called the slug. So, U.S. customary unit of mass is the slug. How many slugs of mass do you have got? Do you have, excuse me? Um, it's more typically used kilograms, even in the United States, so that's pretty much that. One other thing that you gotta be a little bit careful of um, is if you have things that are multidimensional, spatially, say you've got some area, right? volume for that matter, you've got to remember that each dimension has to be converted. So if I've got something that is like this, one meter, excuse me, let's do one foot, one foot by one foot, and I say what's the area, the area is going to be the length times the width, which is just one foot times one foot, and we have one foot times one foot is equal to one foot, one square foot, one foot square. So we've got one square foot there. Well, what happens if I say I want it in meters? That's going to be meters squared, right? Square meters because it is area. So there's a couple different ways that you could look at this. What you don't want to do is just say, well, one foot, 0 0.3048 meters, so it's just going to be 0 0.3048 meters squared. That would be incorrect. You have to convert both unitizations of feet. So in this, we could say this is just as well 0 0.3048 meters by 0 0.3048 meters. Thus, we'll have the area is going to be 0 0.3048 meters times 0 0.3048 meters is going to be equal to, do that really quick, 0.3048 squared 0 0.0929, 0 0.0929 square meters. 
So the point of just showing you that is that you've got to convert every dimension. Ultimately, we could come up with this that one foot squared is equal to this amount. And that gives us another unit conversion between areas in square feet and square meters. But something you've got to be a little bit careful of. Always make sure that you're converting all of the dimensions. All right. So what else do we want to look at? Powers of 10 prefixes. And we'll talk a little about significant figures and go from there. All right, one second. All right, so we've also got ourselves some power of 10 prefixes that are important. They come up once in a while when we're denoting certain quantities. You can find them in the book and homework and on exams and all sorts of places. So you've likely seen these power of 10 prefixes before. And ultimately, let's go over them really quick here. So, <clears throat> this power of 10 prefixes. we can start off with making some values smaller by throwing on a power of 10 prefix onto the proper unitization of that quantity. So we could do, uh, let's see, deci. It's 10 to the negative one. So we could talk about a decimeter, which would be one tenth of a meter. Not too common, but this he comes up once in a while. More common, we have cent. centimeters, centiseconds. Usually we stick with like centimeters, but that is one one hundredth of whatever quantity we're utilizing this for. And we've got milli, milli, ten to the negative three, and then we start going in threes from there. So after milli, we've got ourselves micro. That is 10 to the negative 6. And we've got ourselves nano. 10 to the negative 9. And pico. 10 to the negative 12. There's more after this, but usually we'll stop at pico here. In this particular course, we won't even see pico. Next semester, though, we'll have some pico going on, some pico coulombs and such things. Nonetheless, we've got these. How do we represent these? Well, this prefix is just D. This prefix is just the letter C. This prefix is an M. This one is mu. Greek letter mu, sharp, rounded, that's how I draw the mu. You may see it look a little bit different in different scripts, but that's how I draw my mu. And then we've got nanos, just n, and pico is p. So <clears throat> what's the point with these? Well, sometimes we've got some really, really small numbers, and it gets painful to write out these small numbers without some power of 10 prefixes. So say we had some number that was like, oh, 0.00000276 meters. So what happens if we want to rewrite that out in a more fashionable sense, utilizing some power of 10 prefix? Well, we could start counting over decimal places well, something convenient pops up. There's one, two, three, four, five, and there's six decimal places. So I could call this instead of 0 0.00000276 meters, I could call it 2.76 times 10 to the negative 6, or 2.76 micrometers. So this is the same thing as 2.76 micrometers. That's how we write this out. 
if we wanted to write it out a little bit different, we could also go over three more places, one, two, three, and we could call this 2,760 nanometers. These two numbers are the same, and boom, to this number right there. Which one do you want to write it in? Generally speaking, this would be the more um, sought after form, but really just a matter of how do you want to write it out. They're all the same number, bottom line, just different ways of expressing them. So that is making things smaller. Point is, this number would get really old writing over and over if you had to. This is nice and succinct, right? So there is making, again, some number smaller. Then we've also got making numbers bigger. So we've got ourselves kilo, which is 10 to the third power. We utilize lowercase k. And then we've got ourselves mega, 10 to the sixth power, which is capital M for the prefix. And then we've got ourselves giga, 10 to the ninth, which is capital G. And Terra, 10 to the 12th, capital T. Again, there's more of these as well. We're not going to go beyond Terra, Terra, excuse me. And that's pretty much that. So, <clears throat> for instance, instead of saying something like <clears throat> one, seven, two, six, one, five, four, three. Say, uh, let's do this one in seconds. Seconds. Well, I can start moving the decimal place to the left. Move it over six places, and I can write this as seventeen. 0.261543, where we shortened it up, except I've changed where the decimal place is. I moved it over six places, well, six places to the left, that's 10 to the six, that would be mega. So this would be a mega second. And if we wanted to start writing it off, we could do things like that. Again, just another way of writing it out. So that's pretty much that. So just be aware of power of 10 prefixes in solutions especially. Sometimes the number you have in your calculator does not look like the number, say, in the back of the book in the solution. It could be the same number. Look for power of 10 prefixes and just see what's going on there. Which also brings us to scientific notation. Scientific notation is a nice way of representing numbers that gives us the ability to do a couple things. It gives us the ability to write very large or very small numbers. We've been rounded off to some number of significant figures in a very nice, concise manner. And it also endows us with the ability to know the degree of accuracy which that quantity is known to. And that has to do with significant figures. So <clears throat> we've got scientific notation. And Significant figures kind of go hand in hand, if you will. So let's start with scientific notation. A number written in scientific notation is a number followed by a decimal place, followed by some other significant figures. Single digit, I should say, not just a number.
then followed by the power, so 10 raised to the power. So that is scientific notation. So here's a little example of this. 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19. That is written in scientific notation. We've got a single digit here, followed by a decimal place, and other significant figures, followed by 10 raised to the proper power which well, depends on the quantity itself. Instead of writing this out like this, well, we could also say this is 0 0.0. Whew, we could write it out like that. I had to be really careful to make sure I had the right number of zeros there. 18 of them, because I'd have to move over 19 places, leaving us with a 1 there. And this is the same number here. Which one do you want to write out over and over? Or even just once for that matter. I take this. 1.602 times 10 to the negative 19 instead of this one. That gets a little bit old right now. So the scientific notation is all really prefixed on, not prefixed, but um, <clears throat> revolving around taking some number, raising it to the proper power of 10, excuse me, times 10 to the proper power, that gives us the proper number itself. This happens to be, if we go ahead and throw on a C here, the, num the number of coulombs of charge of an electron or proton, absolute value. Not really important, other than, hey, we can write ourselves a really, really small number in a pretty, pretty easy way there. There's also things like this, right? What happens? So we want to write this in scientific notation. Well, we could go like this. We'd say that this is just as well 3.00 times 10 to the eighth. If I wanted to say that all of these were significant, I could, but I just ran this off to two, two digits and call it this. This happens to be the speed of light in a vacuum, or to three significant figures the speed of light in a vacuum. Three times 10 to the eight, 300 million. And then we throw on some units, meters per second. That's how fast the light travels. We'll deal with that later on. But again, take something that's a pretty big number, not out of hand big, but pretty big number, and write it down in a nice whole succinct manner. That's the scientific notation portion. Then we've also got the significant figures portion. The significant figures portion really comes down to what degree of accuracy do you know a number? To what degree of accuracy can you measure it? That's really what's determining how many significant figures you can have. Well, <clears throat> this is where significant figures comes in to be entangled, if you will, with scientific notation. This has a very definitive number of significant figures. You count the first one, that's significant. Anything past the decimal place is also significant. This is three significant figures here. One, two, three. This quantity here is ambiguous. We can't tell what degree of accuracy we know it to. It could be that we know it all the way to this place. Or it could be that we just have one significant figure here. These zeros here are not truly significant. Yeah, they could be or they might not be. Just, it's ambiguous, like I said. So scientific notation gives us a really definitive way of describing these quantities and making sure that we're aware of to what degree of accuracy we understand that quantity to be. In this particular class, we're gonna find that for the large portion of things, we stick with three significant figures. However, sometimes we're going to be doing interim calculations 
and we don't want to just round stuff off in between. Sometimes you'll need to multiply something, then divide something, then multiply something else to get some final answer. What we want to do is carry through all of the figures that we have that our calculator gives us, and then at the very end, we'll round off to the same number of significant figures that the problem numerically gives us in terms of the quantities, which will generally, again, be three significant figures. I don't like to get hung up too much on all the rules and stuff for significant figures, because we're using calculators, we're carrying everything through, but the general rule is you should end up in your answer with the same number of significant figures as a value in the question that has the least number of significant figures. That is to say, if a question asks you, what is 30.0 centimeters times 6.0 centimeters? Well, 30.0, that's three significant figures. 6.0, that is two significant figures. So in the end, your answer should have two significant figures, which we could say is 180 centimeters squared, or we could say that it's 1.80 times 10 to the 2 um, centimeters squared. That would be fine too. Moreover though, hey, round stuff off at the very end, two, three significant figures throughout this course, and you'll be good. Don't round stuff off in between though. If you've got to recalculate something and take that number then and multiply it by something else and it's not a next sort of feature in your calculator, write it out to five significant figures. Punch it back in. Usually, you're just going line by line and you can go next or answer, so it puts the whole, whole, uh, <clears throat> whole numeric value into your calculator. But if it doesn't, don't just round stuff off in between, at least to, don't round it off to three significant figures. That's what the end result should be. Run it off to five, six. Use your calculators to give you 11, 12 significant figures. At that, do you have to use scientific notation? No, you do not. You do not. Sometimes it comes in handy. Sometimes it doesn't really um, become a necessity. It just really depends. Usually, it comes in really handy for very, very small numbers or significantly large numbers where we're not utilizing power of 10 prefixes. Though we could still utilize those two. I think it's a little messy though. So, just be aware of scientific notation um, and significant figures, something that we're gonna deal with. And we'll get used to it more and more as we work through problems throughout the course on the board. I will be utilizing significant figures and such things. Sometimes four or five significant figures, but that's just up to me. Anyways, this is a good place to begin. Got a little bit of not background, but initial things out of the way. And that sounds good. All right, well, it's been fun. Until next, take care.